Barakat Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Bacha Kudash. Welcome to another live lesson. The name of this one is One is the Other Not Yet Come and the Eighth Head. And this is just basically like a lamb lamb back off of a lesson that the uh, elder Dimash and myself did yesterday. And uh, pretty much, you know, we were going into, you know, Babylon is finished. And we were going through different points, you know, in history. And uh, pretty much, you know, before we close the lesson out, we touched on a couple of articles dealing with, you know, the peace of Rome, the peace of... Britain and the peace of America and um, that pretty much ties in prophecy and I kind of wanted to go into that and just hit the precepts and go back into that some of that information and kind of touch on those things to show you how you know prophecy plays a big part in everything that we do and it plays a big part in everything that we see today and if you don't understand that, then that means that first and foremost, you're not a prophet and you're not a part of the elect. Now, what I'm going to do to start off with is I'm going to uh, read the, uh, a couple of uh, verses in the book of Revelation. And then once I read those verses and go through it and break it down... Then we're going to go through some of those articles real quick, hit a few points from the articles to show you how it ties into prophecy. And then um, maybe hit another couple of precepts and close out the lesson. Because this is how prophecy works. See, Esau, these scholars, they can go into prophecies in the Old Testament and they could break things down based off of historical events that already happened. You know, they cannot break things down as far as prophecies that haven't happened yet or that are in the process of happening. You know, what they're good at is going back into the history and pretty much revising, you know, um, information that have been put down by other scholars in the past, you know, and embellishing on that based off of the history that was already written and historical events that have taken place that tie into prophecy. But when it comes to modern prophecy, they can't break that down because the Spirit of the Lord is not with them. The only reason why they can break old prophecies down is because they're just that old and they already happened and came to pass. Because the scriptures say that the wicked shall not understand. So we're going to go into Revelation 13 and 1 first. We're going to read a couple of verses here and then jump around and take it from there. All right, so Revelation 13 and 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And this was the apostle John who was on the island of Patmos. He was pretty much you know, sent there as a punishment for what they claim to be seditious activity. The Roman Empire considered to be seditious activity. And the, the um, island of Patmos was just one island out of many which are called the Sporads. You know, if I'm pronouncing the word correctly, which were a bunch of different islands that were used to exile Anyone that was, you know, um, accused of sedition and other particular crimes of that nature. And the Apostle John was on this island because, you know, he was preaching the, the uh, gospel, which the part of the gospel is teaching that Yahawashai is going to come back and take his rightful place on the throne and conquer all of the kingdoms and empires that are here today. So that to the Roman Empire was seditious because they were in rulership at the time of this prophecy. 
All right, it says, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So the apostle John actually saw an actual beast coming out of the sea and he described it as he saw it. But that particular beast was a representation of world empires of a particular nation rising up and ruling over the earth until a certain period of time, which would be the time of the end when Yahweh Shah would come back. And we know that pursuant to prophecy, you know, Esau is the end of the world. And if that's the case, and we see all of the prophecies playing out on the planet today, as Yahweh Shai said, they would before it's coming, then that would mean that the people that are ruling today, which are so-called white people, it's not the Chinese, it's not the, the uh, Japanese, it's not the so-called Africans, it's not none, no, no, the so-called Arabs, the so-called East Indians, and so on and so forth. They're not ruling the earth. The ones that are ruling the earth and hammering out policies for people to follow after are so-called white people. So if that is the case, that means that the so-called white people, so-called white men, are the Edomites, their whole nation, because the Lord said that Esau would be ruling at the end. So this particular beast that the Apostle John saw represented their empires. So you could understand. But he saw it as an actual beast and he wrote it as and described it as he saw it. It says, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And if you know, you know, about the seven heads and ten horns, and the empires that it represents, it represents the Greeks, the Romans, the French, the Spanish, Germania Major, Germania Minor, and Britain. These are the seven major empires of Esau that have ruled on the planet Earth. And out of that union of seven came one more. And that was the eighth. And that is where we, in, we are in prophecy. Is the downfall of the eighth head that stemmed out of those seven so-called European countries or European empires, which are really Edomites. Right? And upon his head the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, because it's giving you the beginning of the beast, which was the Greeks. There's a t uh, terminology or a phrase, history began with the Greeks. No, history did not begin with the Greeks. History began way before the Greeks. But the history of Esau, as far as so-called, as far as them calling themselves so-called Europeans, and what you see today in the world started with the Greeks, yes, but it really goes back to Esau, the Edomites. You know, but the modern, you know, history going back about 2,300 years or so started with the Greeks. All right? And that was the beginning of the empire. Now, there is going to be an Edomite nation that's going to be at the forefront of bringing them down. But they are not a part of that seven head union. And that would be the Russians. And that's why it says, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. Why? Because the bear, which represents the Russians, will be what is going to bring an end to their empire when Yahweh Shai comes back. Because that's who the Lord is going to use to bring them down. You can read Ezekiel the 38th chapter, the 39th chapter. You can read. Um, Isaiah 13 and around 17. You can read Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, so on and so forth. It says, And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Now, the mouth as the mouth of a lion would be the mouthpiece. And that lion represents Britain or England. Because although America you know, is ruling through uh, uh, empire status the British Empire behind the scenes is controlling whatever America does because who lives in England the Rothschild family and the Rothschild family which are the head families they're the ones that are calling the shots along with other you know um, international banking families of the world it says uh, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority, right? Because 
the dragon represents, you know, represents Rome, but it represents that whole rulership of this beast, you know. And the Lord gave these devils that power and that authority, all right. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Now this head that was wounded to death represents the, uh, the Roman Empire. Because right in the year that this uh, vision, these visions were given to the Apostle John, the British, I mean, sorry, the uh, Roman Empire, as far as Edomites ruling, came to an end. But Jake continued on that, you know, legacy, so to speak, or the uh, pagan Roman Empire, you know, well after the Edomites or the 12 feathers were destroyed. All right. And it wasn't until Constantine sat on the throne in 325 AD that Christianity, which was a pagan form at that point, uh, became the official religion of the empire. Henceforth, you know, removing that, um, removing that pagan Roman empire in name away from the Roman empire and putting on the label or the color of uh, Christianity upon the empire. All right. So it says, uh, and his deadly wound was healed. So from that point of around 325 AD or so, for a period of a thousand years, which when you do the history, you, you'll type, you, you could go to Google right now and type in what empire lasted a thousand years. And they're going to tell you the Byzantine Empire. And that is a thousand year rule, prophecy wise, scripture wise, you know, that was, that was said to happen when this head that was ruling during the time of Yahushua and the time of the Apostle John, so on and so forth, was put down for a period of time. It was wounded to death, you know, and, and the wound lasted a thousand years. It says, and his deadly wound was healed. When was his deadly wound healed? During the time of the Renaissance period. You know, and that's when they started changing all of the art, you know, you know the history on it. And those of you that don't, keep on watching. That's another lesson. For another time, you know, this is when they actually took over from Jake and took over those regions, you know, where the dark nations were ruling and put themselves up as being the Most High, Yahweh Shai, the angels, the Israelites, so on and so forth. All of the great men in history, they put a white face, so-called white face over it. All right, and all the world wandered after the beast because from that point on, the Renaissance, which means rebirth, until now, the world has been deceived into thinking that this man is the Most High, Yahweh Shai, the angel, so on and so forth. And everybody wandered after them because everybody wanted to be like them because of the, the because they thought first and foremost that they were the power of God. So you could understand. And because they wanted all of the benefits that America had to offer because they, it was the time, it was their time. All right. So let's jump from there real quick. And let's go to the book of Revelation 20 and 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. The bottomless pit represents Europe. Lands are, are considered to be pits. You can go to the Apocrypha, you know, um, I'm not sure if that's Second Ezra chapter 5 or chapter 6 or in Ecclesiasticus where it speaks about, you know, the Lord loving one pit and that was the land of Israel, you know. And the great chain represents what? It represents a restriction that was put upon them to where they could not push, you know, their deception upon the world for a period of a thousand years. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So all of these titles, dragon, which you're reading about the dragon, old serpent, devil and Satan, they all apply 
to this particular beast, which represents a uh, union of Edomite empires. All right, you got the word dragon, draconian, you know, fierce rule. You have old serpent, which is what? S subtility, you know, wicked wisdom. Then you have devil, which means slanderer. And then you have Satan, which means adversary. People get all tripped up over these words because they don't understand the meaning of them. So for a thousand year period, the this nation of Edomites was put in a restrictive place to where they could not move in deception like they were they they're used to doing. It says and cast them into the bottomless pit, which is, once again is Europe, and shut them up and set a seal upon them because they were sealed up. They had a dark cloud over them that they could not get away from. It says that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So we're at the loosing of a little season of this, you know, resurrected empire coming back. You know, in the form of, you know, of course, Britain, you know, these other European countries, and especially America, which is the capital, you know, or the new Rome, so you could understand. All right, so let's go back to Revelation chapter 13. So it said that they wandered after the beast, right? Verse 4, Revelation 13 and 4, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, right? Because everyone today worships America, and they worship this beast. Because America, or the, the dragon, or this beast, represents America, uh, uh, NATO, and the EU. That whole coming together of these European nations, right? Who is able to make war with him? Because you have America already as a superpower, then combined... With these European allies, you know, you're talking about some major firepower, some major artillery, some major numbers as far as troops are concerned. All right? So it says, uh, and he opened his mouth and blasphemed against the Most High to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And how did they do that? During the Renaissance period. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, which you saw that over here when they came to the Americas, conquered the Israelites that were here, brought the rest of the Israelites into captivity or slavery over to this side of the world. And we're seeing that play out ever since they came over to this side of the world to conquer it. It says, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And who is that? That is... The American way, all right? You have something called Americanization, which is stemmed back to Hellenization, which went into Romanization. Today you have Americanization, and you see traces, you know, all over the world of the, of the American influence. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So pretty much they won't, Whoever is not a part of the elect of the nation of Israel, they're going to be under the spell of Esau and stay under that spell. So when we jump to the 13th verse, I'm sorry, to the 11th verse, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. This is the one that was wounded to death, but the deadly wound was healed. But it took on the form of America. And they had two horns like a lamb. This represents your two political party or bipartisan, which they call bipartisan, which is really one, but two, they speak as a lamb because they speak as if they're going to help, but they never do. And he spake as a dragon. This is where you get your draconian legislation. But this is the point here. And he, this beast, exercised all of the power of the first beast before him, which is what? The one that was slain and causes the earth and them which dwelt therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And that was the Roman Empire. And if you look at the way that America was started, you look at all of the tenets of America, 
they're all based upon the ancient Roman ways. So much so that you still have Roman numerals. Uh, when you when you're in uh, any uh, office, you know, of law or any other, uh, um, you know, certain other. Um, um, the word I'm looking for. Well, anyways, to put it to you like this, you have Latin names or Latin terminologies for law and so on and so forth. When you look at the architecture of America, as far as governmental buildings, not just any old building or any old home, when you look at the architecture of governmental buildings, municipalities, so on and so forth, they're all in the fashion of the ancient Roman Empire. Why? Because America is exercising all of the power of the first beast before them, which was the Roman Empire. Now, I want to look at this word exercises just to see what it says. Poeo, poeo, poeo. I know I'm not pronouncing it right, but you know, hey, I don't speak Greek. It says to make with the names of things made, to produce, construct, form, fashion, etc. So, in other words, to bring to life or resurrect back the a former thing to be the authors of the cause to make ready to prepare to produce bear shoot forth to acquire to provide a thing for oneself uh, let's see uh, put forth the authors of a thing the designation of time Uh, right, so pretty much to exercise, you know, pretty much to be or to put into effect, you know, something from the past. Because it says that he exercises all of the power of the first beast before him. So they're the authors, you know, that, that uh, took on the ways of the ancient Roman Empire. Now, when we go to Revelation 17 and 7, it says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which have seven heads and ten horns. So we're going to find out about this beast. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, because it was in the Apostle John's vision, but it wasn't time for this particular beast to, you know, uh, come to pass, because there would be way 2,000 years in the future. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, because America did come out of Europe, out of those other European empires, right? It says, and go into perdition, because the very reason America was created was to be destroyed, all right? To bring about this whole new global system that you see, um, introduce the MOTB, and eventually to be destroyed. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. And through America, the whole world was, was pretty much mesmerized. And this is why it says that this Babylon the Great, you know, causes the, the whole earth to be influenced by her in so many words. It says, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Once again, they're not part of the elect. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Because although it wasn't, it, although it, it was in the vision, but it wasn't time for it to rule. But eventually, it will come in the near future. Well, actually, in the in the far, in the distant future. It says, "And here's the mind which has wisdom." Now, the angel is going to break down what this beast represents. It wasn't an actual beast, but it but the apostle John saw it as the actual beast. It says the seven heads are seven mountains which represent governments. We've broken that down before. When you have meetings of top governments on the planet, they have what? Something called a summit. What is a summit? Top leaders of top governments coming together to meet. What is a summit? A summit is the top of a mountain. So it says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits because America is on top of the whole thing. The authoritative power comes from America. See, but the rest of those so-called European countries, they carry America. 
she's sitting on the throne because America is Babylon the Great who was sitting on the throne on top of, of all these different nations at the top. And there are seven kings which shows you and kings represents rulership which shows you that it's not talking about an actual beast. It's not talking about Satan. It's not talking about none of that stuff. Five are fallen because during the time when the Apostle John had this vision, right, the empire that was ruling was the Roman Empire. And they had conquered all of those regions in that, in that area. The five that are falling are the Greeks, the French, the Spanish, Germania Major, Germania Minor. They were under the subjection of Rome. And one is, the one that is, is the Roman Empire because it was during the time of the Apostle John. And the other is not yet come, which is the British Empire. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space because he only had a short rulership until the next beast would come in and take over which uh, as we read the 11th verse and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition so the short space that the, the uh sixth one i mean the seventh one would hold they would only hold for a short period of time and this is why it's important to you know understand history and understand what it means by these packs, P-A-X, what is meant by that, which is the peace. Now, you, when I typed in how many packs are there, P-A-X, apostrophe S, P-A-X, apostrophe S, and it gave me a, a list of different, you know, about a good 12 to 15 of them, right? With different countries involved, you know, so on and so forth. But they're all named... In Latin, Pax followed by the name of that country in Latin. Why? Because the first Pax was Pax Romana, which was the peace of the Romans. And all those other ones were modeled after that, you know. But the ones that we're dealing with are the ones that are pertaining to prophecy, which are European, European nations, right? And the first one we're going to deal with is the Pax Romana. It says the Pax Romana, literally, I'm sorry, Latin for Roman peace, is a roughly 200 year long time span of Roman history, which is identified as a period and golden age of increased and sustained Roman imperialism. Now it says nearly or uh, roughly 200 years. And then when you type in how long does an empire last, it lasts roughly about 250 years. Some less, some a little more, but roughly about 250 years. The, um, the uh, strong foothold of independence for America was in 1776. And in 2026 will be the 250th year. And what are we seeing? America waning, falling. Their, their, their influence is falling in the, in the world. You know, the economy is, is a disaster. You know, people are trying to get away from America. Right? It says, relative peace and order, prosperous stability, hegemonial power, and regional expansion because they had, you know, uh, uh, bodyguard status over those nations and they also expanded their region and absorbed those different nations that were around them into the Roman Empire. It says, this is despite several uh, re revolts and wars and continuing competition, I'm sorry, yeah, competition with Parthia. It is traditionally dated as commencing with the ascension of Augustus, which is uh, Caesar Augustus, founder of the Roman Principates in 27 BC and concluded in AD 180. It says, with the death of Marcus Aurelius, the last of the five good emperors. You hear Apostle Tara always go into the year of the, 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 uh, the five good emperors. Since it was inaugurated by Augustus at the end of the final war of the Roman Republic, it's, it is sometimes called the Pax Augusta. During this period of about two centuries, the Roman Empire achieved its greatest territorial extent in AD 117, Emperor Trajan, which was a Jake, and its population reached the last Edomite of uh, Caesar was Domitian, which was uh, of the Flavian dynasty, Vespasian, Titus and Domitian. After him, which I believe was Nerva that took over, that's when Jake started ruling. Not in 193 AD with Septimius Severus. 
That was way later. You know, about roughly almost about 90 some odd years later. And its population reached a maximum of, of up to 70 million people, which is around which was around 33% of the world's population, a world's population, according to Cassius Dial, the dictatorial reign of Commodus, later followed by the year of the five emperors and the crisis of the third century, marked a descent from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and rust. And they're always, you know, referring to um, the Roman Empire as an empire of iron. And that's heavy because the scriptures in the book of Daniel 7 speak about the Roman Empire, the fourth, um, uh, that fourth beast being of iron. All right? So, um, there was something else that I wanted to uh, bring out in here. Let me see if I can remember what it was. If not, we'll move on to the next one. Right. This is, when you scroll down, I believe this is it. Uh, let's see. Just bear me one second. So let's see if we can read a little bit of this. All right, well, you could read some more of this if you want, you know. We'll just move on to the next point. Now, the next point, which was really like the major, a major point of uh, another Pax of these Europeans, was the Pax Britannica. Right? Now, Pax Britannica, Latin for British peace, modeled after Pax Romana, was a period of relative peace between the great powers during the, this time, the British Empire became the global hegemonic power, just like Rome was. And remember, we read that one is and the other is not yet come. Develop, and this is the other one that was not yet come, which was the seventh head, which is Britain. Britain. Develop additional informal uh, empire, because they were an empire, and adopted the role of a global policeman. Now, we did read about a global policeman, global policeman or world police, is an informal term for a superpower which seeks or claims the right to intervene in other sovereign states. It has been used firstly by the United Kingdom and since 1945 for the United States. Why? Because they would be the global police just like the Romans were the global police. Then you had the British that were the global police and that power was transferred over to the United States. All right. Though it has been suggested that China has been seeking to take over the role in the 21st century, but they won't. Why? Because we're at the end of the world. And when the world comes back, he's taking Esau down, not Moab. The two terms, hegemon and global policeman, are not identical in meaning. The former term defines capacity for dominant control. Blah, blah, blah. All right, so let's go back to Pax Britannica. It says, between 1815 and 1914, a period referred to as Britain's imperial century, around 26 million square kilometers or 10 million square miles of territory and roughly 400 million people were added to the British Empire. Victory over Napoleon, Napoleonic France left the British without any serious interna international ri rival. 
other than perhaps Russia and Central Asia. When Russia tried expanding its influence in, in the uh, Balkans, the British and French defeated them in the Crimean War 1853-56, thereby protecting the Ottoman Empire. Britain's Royal Navy controlled most of the key maritime trade routes and enjoyed unchallenged sea power. Alongside the formal control exerted over its own colonies, Britain's dominant position in world trade meant that it's effectively control that it effectively controlled access to many regions such as Asia, North America, Oceania, and Africa. The British also much to the dismay of the colonial empires, helped the United States uphold the Monroe Doctrine, which upheld its economic dominance in the Americas. British merchants, shippers, and bankers had such an overwhelming advantage over those of other empires that in addition to its colonies, it had an informal empire. And that's exactly what they were. They were an empire, uh, whether in name or not. I thought there was a little bit more on this. Uh, then it says history. After losing the 13 colonies, a significant part of British America in the, in the American Revolution, Britain turned towards Asia, the Pacific, uh, and later Africa with subsequent, uh, subsequent exploration. And there's a reason why America broke away from them, because it's prophecy. Leading to the rise of the Second British Empire, 1783 to 1815, because the British... Empire ruled as that major empire from about 1815 or 1814 to 1919. Uh, a little more than a uh, hundred years. The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain in the late 18th century and new ideas emerged about free markets, which that goes into knowledge shall increase, such as Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, 1776. Free trade became a central principle that Britain practiced by the 1840s, it played a key role in Britain's economic growth and financial dominance. From the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 until World War I in 1914, the United Kingdom, well actually, yeah, well a little less than 100 years, played the role of global hegemon, most powerful actor, see? So they played that role because it was given to them, but they were only given, what, a short period to rule. Imposition of a British peace on key maritime trade routes began in 1815 with the annexation of British Kailan or Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, under the British residency of the Persian Gulf. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Let's see if there's anything else. Here we go. The last paragraph. The Pax Britannica was weakened by the breakdown of the continental order, which had been established by the Congress of Vienna. Relations between the great powers of Europe were strained by, to a breaking point by issues such as the decline of the Ottoman Empire, which led to the Crimean War, and later the emergence of new nation states in the form of Italy and Germany after the Franco-Prussian War. Both of these wars involved Europe's largest states and armies, the industrialization of Germany, the Empire of Japan, and the United States contributed to the relative decline of British industrial supremacy in the, 19, in the late 19th century. The first of World War, uh, they start, I'm sorry, the start of World War I in 1914 marked the end of the Pax Britannica. However, the British Empire remained the biggest colonial empire until the start of decolonization after World War II ended in 1945. And Britain remained one of the leading powers until the Suez Crisis in 1956, during which British and French troops were forced to withdraw from Egypt under the pressure from the United States and to a less, lesser extent the Soviet Union because it was prophecy had to be fulfilled. That's why they had to decline and the next empire had to emerge, which is America. Now we have Pax Americana. Pax Americana, Latin, American peace, modeled after Pax Romana and Pax Britannica, also called the Long Peace, is a term applied to the concept of relative peace in the Western Hemisphere 
and later in the world after the end of World War II in 1945 when the United States became the world's dominant economic, cultural, cultural and military power. Why? Because it was their time to rule. Pursuant to prophecy. It says, um, in this sense, Pax Americana has come to describe the military and economic position of the United States relative to other nations. The U.S. Marshall Plan, which saw the country transfer $13.3 billion, equivalent to of $173 billion in 2023, in economic recovery programs to Western, Europe country, Western European countries, has been described as the launching of the Pax Americana. Uh, let's see. There was something else in here. Okay, Pax Britannica, heritage. From the end of the Napoleonic Wars until 1815, until the First World War in 1914, the United Kingdom played the role of offshore balancer in Europe, where the balance of power was the main, the main aim. It was also in this time that the British Empire became the largest empire of all time. The global superiority of British military and commerce was guaranteed by dominance of a Europe lacking in strong nation states. And the presence of the Royal Navy on all the world's oceans and seas in 1905, the Royal Navy was superior to, uh, to any two navies combined in the world. It provided services such as suppression of piracy and slavery. So on and so forth, right? Jump down to the next paragraph, the two paragraphs down. During the Pax Britannica, America de uh, developed close ties with Britain. Why? Because America came out of Britain. It says, evolving into what has become known as a special relationship between the two, the mother and daughter relationship. Not the mother and child reunion. Inside joke. Let me read a quick piece of Jeremiah 50, 11. Because you were glad because you rejoice or you destroy destroyers of my heritage because you are grown fat as a heifer at grass and bellow as bulls. This is the Most High cursing out America, Babylon the Great. Your mother, America's mother is who? Britain shall be sore confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of the nations, which is America, shall be a wilderness, because there won't be nothing left here. A dry land in the desert. After the smoke clears, America will disappear. All right, let me see something here. Let's see. Uh, the NOT. But your homeland will be overwhelmed. No, 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 no. With shame and disgrace. I mean, you could say that because America came out of England because of the... The so-called forefathers, you know, came from that side of the world, from uh, so-called England. And a lot of them that came over here were nothing more than criminals. Half the criminals were sent to America, the other half over to Australia. But your homeland will be overwhelmed with shame and disgrace. Nah, that's not, that's not a good one. Let's see, NIV. Uh, matter of fact, in the New King James Version, your mother shall be deeply ashamed. She who bore you shall be ashamed. Behold, the least of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Let's see, NIV. Your mother will be greatly ashamed. She who gave you birth will be disgraced. She will be the least of the nations, a wilderness, a dry land, a desert. Yeah, this place is finished. All right? So we read how you had the Pax Romana, Pax Britannica, you know, which was, um, which was, uh, I guess for lack of better, better words, coined, you know, or established as a uh, uh, Pax Romana. And then you have Pax Americana, which saw America take over that hegemonic slash, you know, global, you know, uh, policeman status. So going back to this, it says, during, back to Pax Americana. During the Pax Britannica, America developed close ties with Britain, evolving into what has become known as a special relationship between the two. The many com commonalities shared with the two nations, such as, a lang uh, as language and history, drew them together as allies. Under the managed transition of the British Empire to the Commonwealth of Nations, members of the British government, such as a Harold 
as Harold Macmillan, like to think of Britain's relationship with America as similar to that of the progenitor Greece to America's Rome. Right, because Greece, you know, Rome modeled itself after Greece, just like America modeled itself after Britain and Rome. Says so throughout the years, both have been active in North American, Middle Eastern, and Asian countries. But the point is that America took over that status. All right. Um, yeah, there was something else that I read earlier, but I can't find it right now. We spoke about America having having the uh, nuclear capability or something like that and at one time they had that power but now all the, well not all but now you have other nations that have that global power or that uh, military power might so going back to Revelation 17 and 12 and the 10 horns which thou saw us are 10 kings I'm sorry 10 and there are 7 kings we, read, we told you what the 7 kings were 5 are fallen told you what the 5 are one is, which is the Roman Empire, and the other is not yet come, which is the British Empire. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And we read about that. Pax Romana, Pax Britannica, Pax Americana. It says, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, which is America, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition, because it came out of that whole union of all seven. All right? And when you look at the, the way that America is established and set up, just like the Roman Empire. And then when you continue reading on in Revelation 13, it speaks about this MOTB system that is being implemented as we speak. With the leader of that being, you know, the Michael C. Hill. I just got a video of mine clipped, you know, off of, uh, uh, off of this channel, which said all roads lead to the MOTB, which is the Michael C. Hill. And they just took, took it off completely. You know, which which that's probably a couple a year or two ago or more. You know, that's how them that's how them devils get down for so-called medical misinformation. You know, you 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 tell me. All right, so with that, you know, I pray that your brothers and few sisters have been edified. This is to show you that prophecy in the scripture, you know, has you know historical accounts, but the spirit has to work with the individual to be able to tie them together. Alright, so with that, I pray that the brothers and few sisters have been edified. Till the next time I say, Shalom.